Good evening and welcome to the City of Pasco Council meeting. The council meeting, or excuse me, the council thanks you for, for being part of our city government. At regular meetings, the city council takes formal actions on items, holds public hearings, and conducts other business of the city. Agenda packets are available on the City of Pasco website at www.pasco-wa.gov agenda. Please note that the city council meetings continue to be held remotely and may be accessed through GoToWebinar. This meeting is being also televised live on Pasco TV, channel 191, on Spectrum Cable and Pasco in Richland, and also streamed on the city's Facebook page, its website, and YouTube channel. This and previous council meeting videos is available on the city's website. Through proclamation number 20-28, Governor Inslee extended the directive making temporary changes to the Open Public Meetings Act. These virtual meetings will continue until the OPMA restrictions are lifted. And lastly, the public may submit their comments and or questions for items not on the agenda by contacting the city manager or the city clerk or using the feedback form on the city's website. So with the housekeeping out of the way, just want to also note again, um, we have a limited amount of people here at the meeting, uh, at, the, at the chamber, and we have our, um, our uh, masks and we have um, sanitizing uh, material in the back and we're using um, all precautions and making sure we're maintaining our social distances and we're more than, more than 15 feet away actually. And, uh, and also encouraging the community to keep on the good fight and uh, to continue to be safe and, uh, and continue social distancing and all, the, all the, the things that we need to do to, to try to control this virus and, and lower our numbers. Uh, we're, still, we're still at a point where uh, we have a lot of work to do, but we're flattening out and going in a good direction. So I just want to continue uh, to do, uh, to promote the good work that everyone is doing and to continue being safe. And, um, and soon we'll get out of this uh, pandemic situation that we're in now. So with that, I'd like to go to the next uh, part of the meeting. And can we have a roll call vote, please? Or a vote, I mean, not a vote, but a roll call, please. Council Member Maloney. Present. Council Member Milney. Present. Council Member Roach. Present. Council Member Serrano. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Barajas. Present. Mayor Martinez? Present. And Mr. Alvarado is out, excused. Thank you, we have excused the absence by Mr. Alvarado. I, I didn't hear, the, was Pete Toronto on? Yes. Okay, I missed that, all right, thank you very much. If you will, would you rise for the flag salute, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And next we go to the consent agenda. All items listed under the consent agenda are considered to be routine by the city council and will be enacted by roll call vote as one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items. If further discussion is desired by the council members or the public, the item may be removed from the consent agenda to the regular agenda and considered separately. First item on the consent agenda is approval of meeting minutes to approve the meeting minutes of Pasco City Council remote uh, meeting held on July 20th, 2020 and remote workshop held on July 27th, 2020. Item B, bills and communications to approve claims in the total amount of $7,526,969.84 in electron, um, $425,298 dollars and 85 cents in electronic transfer uh, notes. Uh, let's see here. Next we go to item C, reappointments to the Tri-Cities Regional Hotel Motel Commission. Uh, I move, let's see here. It's um, to confirm the appointment of Monica Hammerberg from the Hampton Inn and Suites to the Tri-Cities Regional Hotel Motel Commission for a two year term commencing on September 1st, 2019, and ending on August 31st, 2021. And Vijay Patel, Holiday Inn Express and Suites, to a two-year term commencing on September 1st, 2020, and ending on August 31st, 2022. So with that, 
If nobody has any objections to what's on the consent agenda, I would um, entertain a motion. I move to approve the consent agenda as read. There's been a motion to approve the consent agenda as read. Do I hear a second? Second. Council Member Maloney, I'll second that. That's seconded by Mr. Maloney, Council Member Maloney. And we have a roll call for it, please. Council Member Serrano? Yes. Maloney? Yes. Milney? Yes. Roach? Yes. Brahas? Yes. And Martinez? Yes. Okay. Okay. It passes unanimously. Thank you for that. Proclamations and acknowledgments. Uh, none listed. Uh, number six, reports from committees and or officers. Any verbal reports from any council members? Okay, if, uh, if there is no report at this time, then we'll move right along uh, to item 5B. And we have a presentation from the Washington State Department of Licensing. And I will um, turn this over to Mr. Zabel. Do you want to? Give an introduction here, Mr. Zabel. Yeah, just really quickly. Uh, this was uh, something brought to us by uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Barajas uh, with the Real ID Act uh, being implemented in Washington State. Uh, there was a lot of questions in the community about uh, when do I get my new driver's license? How long do I have? And uh, for Washington State, uh, uh, not having an updated uh, driver's license could impact your ability to travel. Uh, particularly utilizing airlines, as well as access to uh, certain federal uh, buildings. And uh, there may be other uh, issues associated with that as well. So to, uh, Ms. Uh, Sandra Najera, uh, Communications and Outreach Manager for Washington State Department of Licensing, has uh, graciously agreed to be here tonight and uh, kind of help uh, educate uh, council staff and the public a little bit on the program and, and uh, how COVID might have impacted it and what our deadlines are. Wonderful. Ms. Nahara, how are you doing tonight? Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation, which has been a long awaited opportunity for to um, present to you on the topic of real ID, which is what started. Um, I, we have a presentation that we can show. Uh, so initially, uh, as you mentioned, it was to present to you information regarding Real ID, um, and I'll be talking a little bit uh, also about COVID-19, how it's impacted our services. If we could uh, click. So our mission is to uh, help every Washington resident live, work, drive, and thrive. Uh, please click. And I've just uh, added the end fly uh, as it relates to Real ID. Click next. So my name is Sandra Nehera. I'm a communications and outreach manager with the Department of Licensing. I am based out of the Tri-City area. We also have an outreach specialist that is out of the Bellevue area. So we do cover um, every area of the state. If we'll click next. Can we advance to the next slide? So I'll be talking about the new implementation date for Real ID. It was set to go in effect uh, in October 1st of 2020 of this year, but it did get moved. It got postponed due to COVID-19. So um, I'll be talking about that, how the changes affect you, what you need to do. Uh, also COVID-19 impacts on DOL services. And we do have instructions to renew online step-by-step -step that we have prepared in English and in Spanish. I provided some handouts in, my, in an email for those that are interested. If we'll click next. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned already, Real ID has been postponed. So we, where before we were encouraging folks to, to hurry up and and get the document that they needed to uh, for real ID. Uh, we're now saying you can wait. Uh, let's click next. So for those of you that may not uh, know much about real ID, uh, what real ID is, it's a, a Congress passed the Real ID Act in 2005. So starting October 1st of 2021, so there's an error on this slide, my apologies. 
Uh, Real ID compliant documents are required for domestic air travel, access to certain federal facilities like military bases, and also access to nuclear power plants. Next slide, please. So you may already have what you need. So, because Real ID is a law, it's not a document. So there are many pieces of existing ID options that will work, including a US passport, passport card, um, could also be a foreign passport, permanent resident card, employment authorization card, your Washington enhanced driver license or ID cards are some examples. Um, you could go to the TSA website to see a full list of documents that are considered acceptable that are Real ID compliant. Next slide, please. So um, the standard Washington driver's license and standard ID card, uh, any, any of those that were issued after July of 2018 are marked with the term federal limits apply. For those of you that were issued a standard license or ID card uh, as of July 1st or thereafter, you might have noticed that marking. That marking um, was put on there so that we could become a real ID compliant state. And this marking is the same regardless of your citizenship or immigration status and cannot be used as evidence or as a basis to determine the individual's citizenship or immigration status for any purpose. Next slide, please. And we, we, what we tell folks uh, is that it's, it's your choice, so you choose the type of ID that works best for you. As I mentioned in an earlier slide, that there are many documents that are real ID compliant, so no, nobody is required to get a new document. Nobody's required to get an enhanced license or ID card if you don't have one. Uh, the choice is yours. The enhanced driver's license does cost more. It's about $4 more per year. So, for example, the standard license is good for is good for six years, fifty four dollars. The enhanced for six years would be seventy eight dollars. The one benefit of the enhanced uh, driver's license or ID card, in addition to it being real ID compliant, um, it also allows you to travel by land or sea anywhere in the Western hem Hemisphere, like to travel to Canada or to Mexico by land or sea. If you wish to travel uh, to Canada or Mexico by air, you will still need a passport for that. Next slide, please. So it's very important to understand the impact um, that Real, the Real ID Act has on our communities because we do have a very diverse community and they are impacted differently by Real ID. They're available uh, their available options will vary and their impacts depends also on their travel habits. So for those that never travel by air, have no plans on traveling by air, this isn't going to impact them. So the ones that are least impacted and that have the most options would be your US citizens, either natural born or naturalized, because they would have a US passport or, or they could have an EDL. Your uh, US permanent residents would have a permanent resident card, which is a real ID compliant document, or they could also have a foreign passport. Those that are somewhat impacted and only have the one option would be like your international students, like, um, uh, or foreign workers and spouses, because, so they would have a foreign passport and they would also have a valid visa and supporting documents. Now, those that are most impacted and may have one option would be those that are in between status, like the DACA recipients. Um, they would have, they may have a foreign passport. They would also have an employment authorization card, which is a real ID compliant document. Now, the ones that are going to be the most impacted and have the least or no option would be our communities, the undocumented community. Uh, they could be DACA, DACA eligible community, um, but or those that have traveled and overstayed their visa. They may or may not have a foreign passport, which uh, for this uh, for the undocumented community, that would be their only option would be to have a foreign um, to get a foreign passport. Next slide, please.
So it's important to know your resources. Uh, we do have all this information on our DOL website. So if you go to dol.wa.gov, you can find um, you, from there, it can take you to our link to our ID 2021 campaign that has all of our interactive quizzes and resources. And it's in additional languages, uh, Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, and Korean. We also have YouTube videos. Um, so highly recommended. Uh, other ID 2020 tools would be um, the TSA website that has all the real ID compliant documents listed there. And as you can see, there's there's other resources like Homeland Security that, that has all the information on real ID. Next slide, please. So I uh, have a little bit of time left. So I wanna talk about uh, COVID-19 impacts on our DOL services. If we'll go to the next slide. Um, so like many businesses, DOL temporarily did close all the driver licensing offices on March 31st due to COVID-19 um, pandemic. Uh, but starting on June 22nd, offices did began reopening by appointment only. And those included the Kennewick Licensing Office. It's one of the offices that, that is currently open. And since then, several more offices have reopened, uh, which has brought the total of oh, statewide of offices that are open to 35. So we currently have 35 licensing offices that are open. They are open by appointment only, and they are for services that cannot be done online, by phone or by mail. So those would be like your first time driver's license, first time ID card, uh, if you have a name change, if you're applying for your enhanced license or ID for the first time, those would require an appointment. And so those, that's something that would, you would not be able to do online. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in April, Governor Inslee did take action to allow DOL to temporarily extend the expiration dates of driver's licenses. And the new expiration date does show on the person's driver's license and so if a person gets pulled uh, by law enforcement, their record will show that their license is valid. So licenses with expiration dates between March 1st of 2020 and June 30th of 2020, they've al already were extended 90 days. So and then we're extending another 90 days for a total of 180 days. So they, that means they have six months after the date shown on their license to renew. And those that expire between July 1st of 2020 and September 30th of 2020 will be extended 90 days. So they have three months from the date shown on their license. Next slide, please. We do encourage folks um, that are in this situation where their license already expired um, to go online, to go to our website and obtain the extension letter uh, it's, so we have an extension letter for the driver's license and you can present it to anybody that's requesting uh, to provide. It could be for, for proof of identity as well. So if your license is expired along with this letter, it'll show that it's still valid. We also have one for instruction permits as well. Next slide, please. And do we, by the way, we, so we do encourage folks to print that letter that I mentioned. But if possible, we are encouraging folks to go online and get what they need to, because there are many online services that are regularly expanded. So for example, and that includes individuals that are under 24, um, under 24 and over 70 are now temporarily eligible to renew their driver's license. Uh, ID cards and instruction permits can also be done online. And you can also renew online even if your last renewal was was completed online, you can you can again renew online. And you don't have to create a license express account to, to do that. Another example of expanded license online services is the non photo instruction permit for so for those students that uh, are in need of an instruction permit, they can now go online and obtain one. Next slide, please. So um, we have our email for DOL communications and outreach if you have any questions and you can also contact us directly. Um, hopefully I left enough time for questions if there's any questions. 
Well, thank you, um, uh, Ms. Sandra Najera. Thank you for that presentation. It was very helpful and very informative. Does any council members have any questions they would like to ask? This is Mayor Pertem Barajas. And by the way, go ahead. Barajas, Mayor Barajas, how are you? <laughs> Uh, no questions, really, Sandra. I just wanted to say thank you so much for for uh, making this happen. Uh, obviously, due to the COVID, it was postponed, but I'm glad you were able to share the information. Uh, thank you, Dave and staff, for <laughs> entertaining my uh, uh, community outreach efforts. Thank you again, yes, Sandra. Uh, and I, and yes, thank you very much. And I did email the handouts for enhanced driver license and ID requirements, also instructions for renewing online. And there were several other documents that I included, so on, also on real ID. So I hope you found that information helpful. Thank you very much for the invitation again. Well, thank you very much. And uh, again, I, I think it was very helpful and I hope that the community who's watching out there uh, you, was able to answer some questions and and get some information uh, in the event that they need these services. So thank you very much. Okay, we'll move right along. Thank you very much. Okay. Have a great evening. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank we'll move right along to uh, the next uh, item on the agenda, which is hearing and council actions on ordinances and resolutions relating thereto. And we have a street vac vacation vacating a portion of East Pueblo Street, uh, and we have a presentation or. Uh, Rick White, are you on the line tonight? I am, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And very briefly, uh, this street vacation request is um, for property in the C3 zoning district east of Oregon Avenue near the intersection of Superior and California. Council originally saw this vacation request in May this year, and there were a number of concerns noted with the uh, the then current configuration of the request, most notably the length of the cul-de-sac that would need to be uh, presented and the uh, impact on neighboring properties if a new cul-de-sac would have to be prepared. Council continued the hearing until tonight's meeting in the hopes that the applicant had uh, would be able to uh, meet with the affected owners and come up with a plan for vacating the entire right of way that has been almost nearly successful. There's still one property owner that we need to process a boundary line adjustment for so that their two tax parcels can be combined, which would um, eliminate a, prop, a parcel without street frontage. Um, we would request council's consideration of extending the public hearing again until the first meeting in September. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. White. Um, this, is there any questions or comments from the council? Yeah, this is Councilman Serrano. I just wanna confirm that that timing uh, coincides with the needs of the applicant. You know, if, as long as they're not in a rush to get some work done, I, I think that's fine in my book. Thank you, Mr. Serrano. No, the applicant does have plans for expansion, but they're not yet um, definitive enough for submittal of a permit application. Excellent. Thank you. And, and based on what I'm seeing, it seems like every other landowner has been um, amenable and in support of this, correct? It, the other affected landowner, let me say. Yes, actually, all landowners are supportive. Uh, the uh, the parcel in question simply hasn't done the paperwork yet at the county to enable the parcel consolidation. Excellent. Thank you. Again, I'm in support of that, uh, then, if, if this isn't going to impact anyone's needs or rights. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Serrano. Anybody else? I, Ma Mayor, could I ask Rick a question? Uh, yes. So, uh, Director White, this is Dave Zabel. So, you had mentioned about uh, parcels potentially being landlocked with the um, vacation, and I'm assuming that is the piece about mid-block north side uh, of the uh, proposed vacation. 
and I see three parcels. And so the idea is to is either reconfigure those three lots so they have frontage on superior or to make them one lot. Is that correct? Did you get that, Mr. White? Did you get that, Rick? We can't hear you. No. Oh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm a little rusty. It's been a week since my last Zoom meeting. Um, <laughs> just north, or excuse me, just west of North Utah Avenue on the south side of the proposed vacation, there are two parcels that are nearly identical in size. One has a building, one does not. Mr. Nunez owns that parcel or both of those parcels. And he is the uh, loan um, parcel combination holdout at this point. And when I say holdout, I'm using that term very loosely. He just simply hasn't processed the paperwork at this time. So what, what we're trying to avoid is with uh, right now, the, the lot without the building is a legal lot because it has access to right away. But if we vacate the right away, it would not, then it would be a, we'd create a lot that we're not by law supposed to create something landlocked. Exactly. Okay. Okay, uh, Mr. Uh, anybody else have any questions before I, Mr. Ferguson, are you on the line today? No, um, uh, it's Mr. Briggs that's on the line. Oh, Mr. Uh, Briggs. This evening. Oh, thank you. Thank you for uh, for uh, attending tonight and taking Mr. Ferguson's place. I, I just want to disclose, and I think this is the proper time. Uh, the hearing the hearing is going to supposedly con supposedly continue, but I need to disclose that I did get an email from one of the landowners uh, encouraging that they would like to for this to happen. But I need to disclose that, being that this is a quasi judicial. Uh, is there any issues with me? Um, with, with this, with getting an email, I just want to disclose that, that this took place. No, I, I don't think that implicates any kind of a personal interest or, or conflict. You, you've just been essentially been provided a, a, a citizen comment concerning the uh, the, the process in, in in this particular app application request to vacate the easement. Okay. So I think. Um, the points that the city manager made are well taken, as well as uh, the points that Mr. White has made as well. Uh, and I think it would still be suitable for you to take part in that vote. Okay, well, thank you very much. I just wanted to make sure that uh, we we're transparent and uh, disclosing all those things. I, there was no response and we will we'll move forward. So with that, if there's no other comments or questions, um, I would entertain a motion. Yes, I move to continue the hearing of the Pueblo Street vacation uh, request to September 8, 2020. There's been a motion to continue the hearing of the Pueblo Street vacation request to September 8, 2020. Do I hear a second? Is this Serrano? I'll second that. Okay, it was seconded by Mr. Serrano. So all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, aye. Uh, opposed, same sign. Okay, it passes unanimously. Hopefully we can get the information uh, needed uh, by September 8th so we can continue the hearing and move forward. So thank you very much. Next, we'll go to the ordinances and resolutions not relating to hearings. We have a resolution uh, for the overpass agreement with Min, uh, Burlington Northern, let's see if we can get the latest one here. Burlington Northern Santa Fe for Lewis Street overpass. Mr. Worley, are you on the line tonight? Yes, I am, Mr. Mayor. Uh, can you hear me okay? I, I can. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, tonight, we are looking at a very long awaited agreement with the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad for the uh, construction of the uh, and operation and maintenance of the Lewis Street overpass project. Uh, this is an agreement that is required by the railroad. Uh, the agreement establishes the responsibilities of all the parties involved in it, including the city, the railroad, and contractors. It identifies compensation for the BNSF for all of the right-of-ways 
uh, and easements that we would acquire. And it would it covers the costs associated with some of the work that we are required to have uh, as part of doing work within the railroad right of way. Uh, city staff and legal staff have been working for many, many months on this, uh, negotiating back and forth. And it's been a pretty iterative process. Um, I can say, however, that the railroad has been open to many of the suggested changes that staff and, and legal have come up with. And for that, we're very appreciative of. There are still a few names that you will notice in some of the documents that are missing. Those are names of BNSF staff that will uh, be inserted once those staff are identified to be the contacts for this project. This is the last document that will close out the right-of-way process. Uh, this process has been going on for many years now, I think since 2013 or 2014. And so this is required once we get this agreement executed by both the railroad and the city, then we are able to get the right-of-way phase certified, which is an approval process by WashDOT. And from that point, we can then move on into the construction phase which begins by submitting paperwork to obligate the funds to build the project. So with that, what I'd like to do is go over the map of the right-of-way with you. The first uh, picture that you see there shows the limits of the project. It goes all the way from 2nd Avenue to Oregon Avenue. You can kind of see the alignment of the new um, Lewis Street overpass. It is to the north of the existing alignment. And then the easement agreement or the uh, overpass agreement tonight is that area in the middle right over the Burlington Northern Railway right of way. So next slide, please. So this slide gets a little complicated because it shows all of the different types of easements and uh, area acquisitions that we are required to get from the railroad. And I'll start out with the, the north end of it. Uh, you can see at the northeast end, there's a little kind of a rectangular, kind of a trapezoidal section uh, off of there. And that is the actual access point that the railroad has identified for the contractor to enter into the railroad right of way. And so they've identified that and the pink areas are what are considered to be temporary construction easements. Now, from that area, you'll see an orange line going horizontal across the railroad right-of-way. That is a, a track crossing easement. And you'll, you'll hear a little bit later, some of the documents in this uh, overpass agreement will refer to work that the railroad will do for us. And that is they will build the necessary roadway over the railroad tracks that will allow the contractor to get from one side of the right-of-way to the other side of the right-of-way. So that's what that orange area is. And then from that orange area, all the pink area to the south provides temporary access to the bridge area. And so the yellow and the, I don't know what you call it, blue areas are the actual easement for the overpass. Uh, the yellow is the aerial easement, and the blue are the actual piers or the concrete uh, support structure for the bridge. So those will be permanent easements, but they have different meanings because uh, the yellow, nothing touches the ground, but it goes over the right-of-way, and the blue areas are the actual areas where there is structure on the ground within the railroad right-of-way. South of that is another temporary access easement, and that's an area between the new bridge and the existing underpass. So that's a temporary access easement. The two green areas that you see north of where the new bridge is gonna be built, those are permanent access easements. So those are ones that will stay in place forever, and that will allow the city to access the bridge to be able to do inspections and maintenance. And then the very last item is the pink one to the south, uh, and that one is to the south of the existing underpass, and that one is just an area that is needed temporarily because the existing road goes right up to the railroad right-of-way line, 
And in order for the contractor to do work, he actually has to get on railroad right of way to do improvements along the roadway. So there's a temporary access easement needed for that. So while we've got that map up there, what I'd like to do now is just go through the agreement in the exhibits. And the reason I wanna do this is because we're not gonna go through each one of them. I just wanna outline it because it can get very confusing as to what's what within this agreement. There is a lot to it, but the overall agreement that you that we're asking for council approval tonight is the very first one it's called the overpass agreement and in that overpass agreement it references several exhibits so the overpass agreement itself identifies the responsibilities for all the parties uh, as part of the dedication of easements and right-of-way to the city the first exhibit that is referenced is exhibit a and those are the project drawings these are not included in your packet because there are just literally too many of them. Those drawings are now with the Burlington Northern Railroad and they are being reviewed as we speak. We've got uh, one set of comments back and we've returned it, uh, responses back to them with changes to the drawings. The second exhibit is exhibit B and that's the actual easement agreement that we will have executed by the railroad once the overpass agreement is signed by the city. So the idea is you do the overpass agreement first and then you execute all of the easement agreements. And that will be for both the temporary and the permanent. Now, what gets confusing is there's an exhibit B1 to exhibit B, and that's a memorandum of agreement that goes with the easement agreement. Why they do that, we're not sure, but that is what they require. The next exhibit is exhibit C, and these are all the contractor requirements. These are all the things that the city is agreeing to require of our contractor when they do work within the railroad right of way. This is written more like specifications, which works well for us. There's an exhibit to this exhibit, and that's exhibit C1, and that is a copy of an agreement that the contractor will have to execute with the railroad. And so all of these items will be in the bid package and every contractor who bids the project will be aware of all the terms of the agreements that they will have to enter into in order to build this project for us. The next exhibit referenced is exhibit D and that's where all the uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe cost estimates are for the work that the, the railroad will do for us to support this project. One of the first ones is the track crossing that I mentioned. That's the orange one at the top of the map that you see on the screen right now. And then the other two are flagging, which is required anytime you do work in a railroad right of way. And then also inspection work. Uh, the railroad wants to be compensated for any inspection work that they do to ensure that the contractor is meeting all of the requirements necessary. The next exhibit identified is exhibit E. And that is a copy of a standard BNSF project plan approval letter. Once the BNSF has approved our project plans, they will send that letter to us and that will be our official approval of the construction documents. And that'll be the one that'll become part of the overpass agreement. Uh, exhibit F is the next one. And that is a special set of requirements for contractors who specifically work on grade separation projects within the railroad right of way. Sometimes you can do work within right of ways that are not grade separated, but this is special information that the contractors have to meet in order to work on a grade separation project. So height clearances and those kinds of things are included in that exhibit F. And then the last exhibit is the project cost estimates. The railroad requires that we give them a very detailed project cost estimate for all of the work that's being proposed and that is what is in that exhibit. So that covers everything that I wanted to cover tonight. I wasn't going to get into specifics. Uh, Mr. Briggs is here this evening joining me to help answer any questions that council's members may have related to this agreement. But I can say that staff and legal uh, have been through this and though it's a lot of documents uh, we've got them all cleaned up straightened out and we believe they're ready to go for council approval
And so with that, Mr. Briggs would be happy to answer any questions you might have. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Worley. <laughs> And uh, Mr. Briggs for being here and, uh, and then accepting uh, questions or answers. Do anybody have any questions or comments? I just am so excited to see that this is one more step towards this project that we've been working on for so long. And uh, just amazing how much work uh, it takes to get, uh, to get something like this to come to fruition. And this is just one more step, one step closer. And I'm just excited. Uh, but again, we have to make sure that all our T's uh, I's are dotted and T's are crossed. So uh, anybody have any questions or comments for Mr. Briggs or Mr. Worley? It's Councilmember Maloney. I have a yes. quick question for Mr. Worley. Um, okay, it's probably not a quick question, but yeah, here you go. Um, so I noticed that so when we approved the um, project management agreement uh, two weeks ago, I think for this, to help oversee this work, um, I kind of wondered why was it quite so expensive, but um, I knew that this was pretty complicated. Getting into this document and the list of requirements and the uh, amount of oversight that is clearly outlined um, in there um, certainly um, provides that additional level of detail. Um, so um, I guess my question for you, Mr. Worley, is um, this is really complicated and in a construction project of this nature with such tight tolerances in, in areas you can go, cannot go with the, the moving parts um, of you know, the literal moving parts of the railroad as well as the uh, figurative ones of of, um, of any sort of project management like this. What do you what are you most concerned about with this particular portion? I guess what do you see as your biggest risks for this this portion here in interacting with BNSF? I, to me, what I would hope for the most, and that is to get a contractor who is a low bidder and who has experience building bridges over railroad right-of-ways. It would be fantastic for the city to get a construction contractor who has that experience. I think the biggest risk and the biggest concern I would have is if we got a contractor who uh, didn't have that experience and we would be fighting them all along the way between what our plans and specs require and what the railroad requires. We want this to be a very well-coordinated effort and we want to partner with the railroad. We want to partner with our contractor and make sure that this is a very successful project. Great, I appreciate that. Um, high quality contractors are going to be, be key here. So I, I hope we're taking the extra effort to reach out and encourage bidders um, uh, um, accordingly. So um, thank you, Mr. Worley. I appreciate that. You bet. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. this is Toronto. I'd like to piggyback on that. To what extent are we, um, I guess, with a very critical eye, developing the bid packages um, in such a way that we can ensure that we get those types of contractors bidding? One of the things that we have done, and which is pretty typical on projects of this size, due to the nature of the concerns that uh, uh, you have just expressed, and that is that uh, we hired a separate engineering company who has experience at designing bridges do what we call a constructability review of the plans and specs that our consultant, uh, JUB engineers, uh, so we had them look at all the plans and drawings that were developed for this and provide comments back to JUB. And then JUB and uh, this consultant met together, went over them, and those changes were added to the construction drawings and the specifications. And the idea there is sometimes when engineers and designers get involved in the details of it, sometimes you get so buried in it, you miss some parts because you can't see the forest for the trees. And having another pair of eyes on the drawings and specifications helps make sure everything is tightly knitted together like it should be. So we've done that on this project. And so we feel very confident that, you know, these plans and specs are gonna be a very good package for contractors to bid. Um, that's our hope. Okay, I appreciate that. I, I love that you're kind of uh, double layering the, the critical eye there. So I appreciate that, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, these, uh, th these jobs are so big and, uh, you know, doing a, uh, you know, 
checking it twice is, is very important, and I just hope that this can uh, go through and be successful like the other big bridges and projects we've done in Pasco, um, and hoping for for a, a, a huge success when, when this is all over. Anybody else have any questions or comments? If not, then um, Mayor Pro Tem, would you like to entertain the motion? Thank you, yes, Mayor. I move to approve, approve resolution number 3976, authorizing execution of the overpass agreement with Burlington, Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad Company for Lewis Street overpass and further authorize the city manager to make minor substantive uh, ad adjustments and to execute all other documents related to the BNSF right of way and this project. There's been a motion to approve resolution number 3976. Do I hear a second? This is Councilman Milney. I'll second it. Thank you, Mr. Milney. It's been seconded by Mr. Milney. So all those in favor uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Worley and Mr. Briggs, and uh, looking forward to moving forward with this. And uh, it just it, it gets a little bit uh, overwhelming for me to see it one step closer. So thank you very much. Next, we'll move thank on. You. To, next, we'll move on to uh, unfinished business. Uh, none listed. New business. We have a, a professional service agreement. Construction management services. Uh, Peanuts Park renovation. Mr. Radkai. Could you uh, yeah. give us an introduction here? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Good evening, Zach Rakai, ACS director. Um, <clears throat> looking at the other side of downtown here on two of our exciting projects, getting into Peanuts Park. This is uh, the item brought before you is professional services agreement for construction management. Um, as you can see, this project will bring fantastic improvements to really our main focal point plaza downtown and really be uh, the other cornerstone in conjunction with Lewis Street Overpass uh, to downtown Pasco's bright future. Um, we chose construction management and to pursue outside construction management um, while Pasco Public Works and ACS staff are very capable. Um, a project of this sort with its visibility, um, the multiple sources of funding from federal, state, and local, um, as well as just the coordination and keeping the timetable of uh, the entire construction project going and the coordination with our stakeholders downtown, uh, staff felt that it was warranted that outside construction management be pursued. So with this, in conjunction with our original construction bid last April, uh, ACS staff did issue an RFP for construction management services, um, the deadline of which was May 13th. We did receive three responses from firms in Washington State. <clears throat> we had a diverse staff uh, do the internal review on this document. Uh, we did individual readings of each RFP response. This was uh, administrative and community services staff, public works staff community and economic development staff really to get a good perspective on construction management groups coming in. Um, they all scored very close. So we had uh, virtual interviews over GoToMeeting, um, which is the only way we can interview these days. And uh, scoring, the cumulative and collective scoring resulted in the selection of McKay Spazito for construction management. Really the qualifications that based our um, Favorable rating was uh, be local personnel in the local office uh, here just out in Osprey Point in Pasco is where they're based out of. Um, they have a clear understanding of the roles of city staff in conjunction with general contractors, um, the construction managers, as well as uh, the need for great um, and frequent communication with uh, our neighboring businesses and our downtown organizations and the various stakeholders in the area that would be impacted by this construction. They understood federally funded projects along with the associated accounting and reporting, which goes to a far greater uh, extent than that of local or state funded projects. Um, obviously, they understood and to reiterate the importance of working with our downtown stakeholders and businesses um, and the thorough understanding of federally funded project. Um, but also the team had a, a lot of a diverse lineage of expertise that they could offer, including a project manager that uh, was a former local government employee doing projects sim similar to this, uh, which we felt was key to the management of the project and interface between general contractors and the city of Pasco. 
So looking at the overall costs for the project, working off two screens here, excuse me. Um, the overall cost for the uh, construction management came in at $322,460. Um, the project's engineer's estimates just over $5.1 million. So the total for the project as we look at um, with the engineer's estimate and the construction management cost, $5.5 million, um, which is within the budget parameters we have outlined at the city. Um, construction management cost represents 5.8% of the total estimated cost for the project. So really, as we look at the schedule and tasks, um, through the scope of work, the schedule is anticipated to run 49 weeks. Now, that's three weeks shy of one year. Um, you might be thinking the construction is, we've been telling you, it's not going to take one year to implement. Um, keep in mind that uh, construction management has um, a ramp up with pre-construction, which is startup, meeting with contractors, um, helping in the bid and selection of contractors, uh, establishing the understanding and the schedule for the project. Um, the construction management part is the day-to-day -day work that uh, this firm will be doing for the city, um, including working with the general contractors when there are shovels in the dirt and action on the site. Um, there will be regular communication with staff, um, regular progress meetings. And I highlighted in red, communication and regular outreach to the stakeholders in the downtown area, which has been a very important part of this project. Um, They'll also, during this project, maintain records, coordinate payments and accounting, and really manage that schedule, keep everyone on task. The extension behind that is once construction ramps down, there is a closeout portion. So the punch list items, the small items that need to be corrected here and there, working to establish our warranty items <clears throat> and overall project acceptance. So that's really going to be the tasks that we're looking forward with construction management here. So roles and responsibilities, obviously City Pasco is the owner of the project and in charge. Um, we are working, uh, I will be working with uh, one of our public works construction managers as well um, to act as city liaisons for the project. Um, we have a, 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 a good portion of the McKay Spazito firm here in the city of Pasco, or here in, in Pasco um, at our disposal, including uh, direct construction managers and some auxiliary personnel to help round out the project and provide a, a diverse background of experience in examining what um, construction is going to be. So getting into the total contract costs, um, the contract that's put forth before you this evening is for $322,000. <coughs> Excuse me. So pre-construction and construction start is broken out as such, $25,569,800. The main construction project just coming on in under $200,000. Now that's going to be the bulk of the work and that's going to be a lot of the day-to-day -day interface on the ground, on site. Excuse me. And then project closeout slated uh, that portion to be just over uh, or just under $29,000. So the breakdown in costs there. Um, <clears throat> those are the basics. Uh, the, the item brought before you this evening is the PSA with an authorization for the city manager to execute said agreement. Um, if there's any questions of counsel, be more than happy to answer them. Um, much like we're seeing with Lewis Street Overpass, Peanuts Park will be a, a pretty regular interval, I think, over the coming year um, here with the City Council. So with that, I'll take any questions, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Rackett. <coughs> I'm very pleased that we have a, a Pasco business at Osprey Point, Greg? Yes. That's, uh, that's going to propose to uh, run this project. and. Um, uh, again, you know, uh, with the previous uh, motion and uh, that we just made and this one, uh, looking forward to how beautiful it's going to be um, and the improvements we're making to this side of Pasco is going to be amazing for economic development, for uh, the vitality of, of, of everything going on here and for our citizens and just just a breath of fresh air to hear that this is actually uh, getting closer again. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, um, I'm glad we're using a, a, a local contractor, and uh, and it comes within our our estimate of what we have budgeted. So, uh, looking forward for it. Anybody else have any questions or comments they'd like to make? Councilmember Maloney. Yes, Mr. Maloney. Hey, Mr. Rakai, um, I'm going to ask you a similar question to what I just asked uh, Mr. Worley. Um, again, so we're in the we're in a spot where the the interactions of this are, are pretty complex from the standpoint of um, I know we want to avoid whatever operations that we can get at the farmer's market um, and of course we have a lot of operating build, uh, businesses immediately adjacent to that. 
So um, what do you see as the biggest um, concern that, that, that you have at this time as, as, as to what the what possible risks we have of um, something going sideways on us in this area? Well, I think it, it's hard to predict with any construction project, uh, Councilman Maloney, what, what could go sideways in that. I think the biggest thing and the biggest basis that we want to establish here is just consistent communication with contractors. This project does involve um, the adjacent buildings. It does involve construction with the adjacent building. And throughout the design process, we've been in constant communication as far as what the intentions are, agreements, um, working together to establish uh, cooperative areas there. But I think what's going to be uh, paramount with this project and what we're looking to establish from the beginning is consistent communication, um, almost down to weekly, um, having stakeholder meetings, inviting business owners out to the site, um, making sure that, you know, that, that, hey, that this is what's going on this week. Fourth Street will be closed or Lewis Street, uh, you know, one of the lanes will be blocked off or we will have impacts on this side. Um, while we can't avoid any, you know, we, we, we can't predict anything that could happen that would adversely impact adjacent business owners, um, having that constant communication builds that trust between the contractor, the construction manager, and the city. And really, that's going to be paramount to the success of this project and, and really overcoming any of those items that could go sideways throughout. Great, I appreciate that. Um, I, I do know one of the adjacent business owners was looking uh, for that vacant building, was looking at um, potentially um, doing a privately funded project that would interface significantly with, with the uh, redesign. Um, do you have any update on that? I know it's not immediately um, relevant to this, uh, well, the matter directly in front of us, but it certainly is uh, a, a tangent from that. Sure. I, th I think recently our, our team has been working with uh, uh, business owners that are closer to the Lewis Street and the occupied buildings. Um, so I would have to check in and see what the update is with that particular building owner on, on, that, on, on that end of the property um, to see what they're up to. But I'm certainly more than willing to do that and bring it back to council at a later date. I'd appreciate that. Um, his designs and his, his, his theoretical planning there was going with I think would be pretty transformative in and of itself. And anything we can do where the public dollar is, is spurring private investment and uh, private development in that same, um, as part of one of these projects um, or in conjunction with one of these projects, I think is something that we'd all be really, really excited to see. So thank you. Certainly, you're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Maloney. Um, Mr. Red, can I, uh, you talked about your stakeholders. There's, uh, what involvement will the Downtown Pasco Development Association have with this project? Just, uh, just curious. Well, cer certainly we've, we've discussed, and obviously downtown, throughout the project, there's been some leadership changes with DPDA. Um, we've discussed the project. We've helped them. Uh, we've discussed design questions, uh, future utilization of the property for the Pasco Farmers Market, as well as design aspects for um, one of my favorite downtown activities, Food Truck Friday, and um, just to kind of see how that's going to best work out with uh, DPDA and their interests as well. Um, they've also been really integral in helping us reach out to uh, some of the adjacent business owners and, and just business owners in that area. Um, with this project coming to fruition, when we start getting construction on the site, um, or even before we start getting construction on the site, when we look up to step up our coordinated efforts with DPDA to make sure that they're informed, they're a trusted partner in getting the word out to stakeholders and um, that they have a seat at the table um, throughout the project. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Okay, if not, then uh, Mayor Pro Tem, would you like to entertain a motion? Yep, I would. Um, I move to approve professional services agreement for construction management services of the Peanuts Park renovation project with McKay Sposito in the amount of $322,460 and further authorize the city manager to execute the professional services agreement. Thank you. There's I'll been second that. There's been a motion to approve the professional services agreement, and it's been seconded by uh, Councilwoman Roach. So, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. And passes unanimously. Thank you for that, uh, Council members. And again, I'm, I'm very, very excited about this. So, thank you very much, Mr. Ratkai, for the report, and uh, move forward and uh, keep us apprised of. Of the situation thank you next we go to miscellaneous discussion um, anybody have any miscellaneous uh, topics they would like to bring up I have one but mr. 
Zabel, do you have anything you'd like to I, share tonight? Yes, actually, Mayor and Council, I do have a, a little bit of work tonight uh, for the Council. And we have four uh, boards and commissions that still need some uh, vacancies filled. And I think the, the subcommittee process has worked out pretty well. I, I know, uh, you know it would be a lot more informative, I think, for Council to to be able to do what we've normally done, but we're still not, we're a long ways from being able to meet to, to everybody uh, interviewing folks at a, at a council meeting. So uh, we need to set up a couple, probably would be my suggestion, subcommittees. We have uh, vacancies in the Planning Commission and vacancies at Parks and Rec Advisory Board, Historic Preservation Commission and Code Enforcement Board. So we have four different boards that we need to to find some folks for I'm, I, my my thinking just looking at them real quick was uh, planning commission and parks and rec are kind of more visionary uh, boards you might have one committee for that and, and maybe one sub subcommittee for uh, historic preservation and code enforcement which is maybe a little bit more related to the condition of a particular or the characteristics of a particular property or or building and so that so there may that, that may be a way to split the interests up and, and not have three people overworked or okay. have four you know it seems like two different subcommittees might might uh, work out pretty well in that regard okay well with that said um, I can tell you <laughs> I have a suggestion and I don't know if she would uh, you would like it that much councilwoman Roach but I would like uh, it, would, it would only make sense that you would be um, on the subcommittee for the uh, Planning Commission would you be agreement, uh, agreed? Uh, would you agree to be on that subcommittee? I'd be happy to oblige. Thank you. Uh, any other two volunteers for the planning commission? No, this is Serrano. I'd like to. We have three people. Oh, so me and them too. Okay, so Mr. Serrano and uh, Councilwoman Roach for the subcommittee of the planning commission. Planning commission and Parks and Rec Advisory. And the park. Yeah, does that okay. work? And then the other one was the historic preservation and code enforcement. Okay, and how about uh, uh, some volunteers for those? Oh, well, I know. Maloney, I'd be happy to help. Mr. Maloney and um, Mr. Milne, would you? I'd be happy to help. Yeah, I can help as well. Yes. Okay. So we have we have the two uh, the volunteers for the two subcommittees, Mr. Zabel. Thank you for Thank you. stepping that. up to the plate, yeah. Council. Appreciate you guys' efforts on that. And if, if uh, Council, uh, if Mayor Pro Tem Barajas would would rather take my place, I'm happy to defer to her. Um, I'll leave it up to her option. <laughs> nope, fine. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Pony, but you're a perfect match. <laughs> okay, we got it. So gracious. Thank you. All right. Okay, we, we got that, Mr. Zabel, thank you very much. I have something that I would like to share tonight, uh, and it has to do with, um, get a little prepared here. I got a message from my son who uh, made a comment and sent me uh, a report that he was, uh, that he was able to uh, find on social media. And I just wanna share real quick that uh, his comment uh, that I wanna start with is just saying, uh, the Pasco PD is amazing, and I couldn't imagine ever going, uh, being in a situation uh, that they that they uh, shared on on a report. And I'm gonna go off uh, based off some notes here, um, and this has to again do with the police department. So the so the police department had um, was in a situation, and I had the opportunity to view a video update of an officer involved shooting earlier this year in our community. The Tri-City Special Investigation Unit is investigating the incident per protocol in officer-involved shooting incidents. The video is on the Pasco Police Facebook page, and I would encourage the community members to view it. The video provides explanations surrounding the incident and video of the incident itself. Because the incident is still under investigation, I will keep my remarks to a minimum, except to say that the film clearly depicts the perils of our off that our officers face and could happen at any time. I appreciate that we have the men and women willing and committed to serving our city in this way. As you will see in the video, police officer, uh, uh, 
Being a police officer can be a dangerous job. I'm grateful, I'm grateful for the officers serving Pasco and the Tri-City commu uh, Tri community. Um, those are just notes that Mr. Zabel helped me out with, but I just want to share that uh, uh, I would warn that if you were able to see this, this, uh, this video and this report from Chief Roski and Sergeant uh, Rigo Pruneta, uh, it's very emotional. Um, it's very, it, it's viewer discretion is advised. But what I was so impressed with was the fact that this report came out and Chief Roski explained and, she, and, and Sergeant uh, Pruneta explained the policies and procedures and how we learn from these events and how the police officers handled the situation. Um, I, I just couldn't, I just couldn't go past, uh, I just couldn't pass it by and not mention it tonight because if you see the video, uh, it gives you a, a real wake up call to what our officers go through at any given time as they're doing their work. Uh, many times police officers get this reputation of just sitting around having donuts and coffee. Well, um, I'll tell you what, um, the next police officer I see, and I'm around donuts and coffee, I want to buy it for him. Because uh, this, this report uh, and, the, and the video cameras that we have, uh, that we're using uh, in our investigations and, and, and for the protection of our officers and our community members uh, was something that just really got me, um, got me to really think about how you know, these officers could be your father, your, your brother, your cousins, your friends. And in my case, I even have a, a, a new sheriff as a son-in-law that may confront these situations uh, at, at any given time. And it's just scary to think uh, that, it, you know, they run into these situations to keep our community safe, to keep uh, p dangerous people off the streets. And, um, and, and these people could be your family members. And it just... I, I couldn't let this go tonight without saying a big thank you and a shout out to Chief Roski, uh, Sergeant Pernetta, and every one of the officers that were involved in this in this situation. Uh, thank you for your your courageous um, for being courageous and for your courage and your willingness to to keep our community safe. And thank you also to the families of these people who are risking their lives every day for our community. So. Um, I was really impressed with the transparency um, with our with our police department and how they're going to use this to to make things even better and safer for the officers and for the people in our community. So I, I didn't. I just want to say thank you very much. Um, it's 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 it was just amazing to see, and I, and I still get a little worked up from from what I saw on that on that rec on the recording. So again, if viewers' discretion is advised. But this is what our officers face on any given day. And once again, for every officer, for every emergency responder, thank you very much for your service. And thank you for your transparency. And thank you for always wanting to do better for our community. So I, I just wanted to share that. So thank you very much. So is there anybody else that would like to make, uh, that has any miscellaneous discussion they would like to bring up? If not, then we can... Uh, move right along to the end of this meeting. So thank you very much. Have a great week, and we'll see you next week. This meeting is adjourned. Have a great night.